Hey there, I'm Pastor Eli, and I want to welcome you to kind of another introduction to, uh, we'll call it part one of a big study that I'm doing right now on uh, something that I think most Christians have, a, have an interest in, but usually don't talk about too much, or, or they talk about it, but they don't really feel confident biblically. In fact, most of the people that I've met that are very, very confident when it comes to this topic, I say this with all due respect, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, I, I kind of laugh off at that a little bit because this is kind of an important thing. And I want to I want to kind of give this introductory part one to kind of give an overview of what's going on. By the way, say hello to my little pet. His name is Omamu, and he is cute and squishy and fluffy, and he helps me to clean my messes. Only the non-spiritual ones. Those those require special kind of blood. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about demon possessions. In grad school, um, at seminary, uh, Andrews University, we talked about this, this particular issue, about how do we do exorcisms, right? At Andrews, we talked about exorcisms. And my experience at Andrews was twofold. It was great. For me, meeting um, like-minded individuals and uh, other families, other young families that, you know, had children, and, and that was great. But it was also awful in the sense that one of the, the main reasons that I was there was to learn. And I didn't learn what I thought was easy to teach and difficult for me to come to my own conclusions, right? And one of those is exorcisms. Pardon the glare. Let me see here. Maybe that'll do it. I don't know. But, I mean, exorcisms. You know what they are. Everybody knows what they are um, in a popular culture sense. But what are they like when we're talking about, in real life, practically speaking, like biblically speaking, what is an exorcism? Like, what, how do you perform one? What does your pastor learn when he's being taught how to do a, a, an exorcism, right? And... They didn't teach us anything, okay? Here's what they told us. Exorcists, demons? Okay, that's the extent of what they taught us. Demons, bad. Stay away from the demons and, uh, you know, let, let the professionals do the work. Who are the professionals? Oh, surprise, it's you. So... That was really frustrating for me. I, I don't think that I have been as disappointed in my seminary experience as I was with this, this particular thing. Exorcisms. Demons are bad. And I thought, yeah, <laughs> of course they are, right? So how do I, what do I do? What passages do I read? Uh, where, who do I turn to? Do I need to talk to a conference official? Does, does, a, does an ordained pastor need to do the exorcism? How is this all going to work out? And like I said, the answer was basically, well, step one, demons. Step two, are bad. Step three, run. Yep, that, that, was, that was it. That was the extent of what you learn at seminary. I am of the understanding that in previous times, exorcism classes were given, um, you know, deliverance ministries classes were given courses were given at seminary sometimes they were uh colloquia i think they started off as classes eventually there were colloquia which was like a like a three hour long big lecture four hour long big lecture sometimes longer and then eventually it was relegated to just just like one class period out of the uh, ministerial general ministerial class and eventually now there, there's basically nothing right why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem on two fronts. Number one, if your pastor doesn't know how to cast out demons, then who's going to cast them out? Brother Jenny? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I mean, what, if, if it's so easy that Brother Jenny can do it, how is it that a trained minister of the Adventist faith, okay, this is a Seventh-day Adventist problem, This is a bona fide Seventh-day Adventist pastor 
Doesn't know how to do an exercise. Okay. Can't even begin to tell you what step one is. Right? If, if they were to say, all right, Eli, what, what Bible text, what are the top three Bible texts that they taught you you're supposed to use in an exorcism? I could tell you zip, zilch, nada, nothing. That's our problem. Okay? That's the SDA problem. The SDA problem is that pastors aren't being taught. There is no formal training, right? When, when, when a pastor is hired by a conference, the conference is the one that oversees the churches. And the conference says, you know, we want you as the pastor to work for us. And in order to be ordained, you have to go through theology school, not just your undergrad theology major. You also have to get your master's in divinity because everything has to be that way now. Don't ask me why. Because that'll be another rant that has to do with money. Right? You, you show up and they, they won't let you go to other schools. You can't go to La Sierra. You can't go to Oakwood. You can't go nowhere. It has to be Andrews University. Where their exorcism class says that demons equal bad. And run. That's our SDA problem. If you can tell, I'm not super amused or jazzed about this. Um, this has come to the forefront because I have a church. Blessed be God. I have a church that has some members. I have multiple churches, actually. And in each one of them, there are people who, who are very, very confident. If you're watching this right now, I apologize to you for speaking strongly. But I, I want to make sure that the point gets across. We are saying things that are, that are blatantly just unfounded. You know what it means to make an unfounded claim? There's a toaster. Here, come, come closer, come closer. Look, there is a toaster. Flying 5,000 miles. <laughs> Above. Surface. Of the sun. Can, can you tell me that's not true? Can you? The answer is no, you cannot. This is a non-verifiable, and <laughs> you could technically verify this, but you, in, in the amount of time right now, there's no way for you to falsify this. This is, this is exactly the kind of thing that people who are teaching uh, deliverance ministries, this is what they're doing. They're making these bold claims with no way to back them up. And here's, here's how it would work if you're a Seventh-day Adventist or if you're a responsible Christian. Here, here's how it works. You've got your claim. And this claim is qualified qualification. What's it qualified by? If you make a claim, let's say that this is a Bible claim, right? Let's say that this is a spiritual claim. If a pastor makes a claim, there is a toaster. The Bible teaches that there is a toaster flying 5,000 miles above the surface of the sun. You need to qualify that. How? Is it qualified by being being a pastor? Right? Well, the pastor said it. Pastor says. Is that what qualifies this claim? If the answer for you is yes, that this is all it takes, you're in big trouble. Because anything your pastor says, any claim your pastor says can be true. Do you see the problem now? Okay, good. I knew you would. Because you're smart. If we're responsible Christians, Bible-believing Christians, then we are going to qualify our claims, especially the claims of a pastor or of a religious leader, by what the Bible says. Okay? If the Bible factually says something, then you're in good order, right? You can, you can, you can take that claim to the bank. You can show up and it's legal tender. If you're qualifying your claims with anything else, right? This is, this is basic Protestant theology, right? Because Catholics don't believe this. Their, their qualification is not just Bible facts. It's also tradition. That's to say, it's not just what the Bible says. It's how we've interpreted the Bible over time, as well as the stories that have been passed down. I think there's a great strength in that. However, I think there's a great danger. Namely, that tradition can be. As, thank you, Omamu. As, as an example, the, the Jewish people of Jesus' time had a tradition of washing hands. 
a ritual washing hands, or maybe it was just washing hands. Who cares? The point is, they were wrong. And Jesus didn't follow that tradition. And what did they do? They got super angry. They're like, how come your disciples are, are eating with unwashed hands? Did Jesus care? Evidently not. Evidently, Jesus didn't care because this whole claim that they had about washing hands was not rooted in what? It was not rooted in the scriptures, namely the word of God. So, when we make these claims about spiritualism, we need to make sure that they're being rooted in scripture. Here's, here's what some of our claims look like today. When we make claims, especially in Adventism, we do this. We say, a day or a year. Yeah? We say a day for a year, and then what do we do? Then we say, ah, here, let me, let me, give, you, let me give you my verification. My qualification is right here. Here is Ezekiel, and here's Numbers, right? Numbers 4. And we say, there you go. That's, that's my claim. Here is where it's in the Bible. Boom, my claim is verified, qualified by what we found in the Bible. Teensy tiny little problem. Both of those are arguably not in context, which means that our claim is on shaky ground. Right? This is the premise for the 2300 day prophecy. For those of you who are new here, welcome. I'm Pastor Eli, and uh, I'm a Seventh day Adventist pastor, minister of the faith. And Adventists believe that they are very special because a long time ago, someone realized hey, this world is not going to last forever. And that, that king's name was King Nebuchadnezzar. He got a dream. There was a prophet amongst him, uh, amongst his soothsayers, whose name was Daniel. He was a Jewish captive. And he interpreted the dream, and later on he would come to have a vision, a prophetic vision of how actually not just the end of the kingdoms would come, but the entire end of the world and the end of the, uh, the whole spiritual experience of Israel culminating into the kingdom of God. So he had this prof prophetic vision of the 2300 day prophecy, right? That 2300 days, evenings and mornings would, tra would transpire until the, clean the cleansing of the sanctuary, you know, and, and that once that happened, then then the sanctuary would be restored, right? which was a really big deal. So Adventists took this principle, well, every day is one year, and said, let's count from the edict of uh, to rebuild the temple, which was 457 AD, I believe. Oh, no, sorry, different uh, 457 C. I need to refresh on all of this. I'm, I'm looking foolish now, right? And they took this and they said, well, because of this, we're going to count forward 200 2,300 years, right? That's the Cliff Notes version. That is not exactly how it happened. However, when preachers get up to preach today, that's how they tell the story. They're like, here you go. Here is our qualification. They give you the shorthand. When, we, when we've qualified our claims via shorthand for so long, our claims become shaky, not because they weren't originally founded on truth, but because we have defended them with less than truth. Does this make sense? Our good claims are being defended by truths that are less than, and that is where the problem comes in. How does this relate to deliverance ministry? Ah, here. Same thing applies to our deliverance ministries. A lot of these deliverance ministries are being based on assumptions. These assumptions based on claims that unfortunately are qualified. Are they qualified by the Bible? Can they point to the Bible and say, this is what the Bible was talking about? Often the answer is often the answer is they can give me some text that is out of context. Right? And that's how people go about doing their assumptions. When I was in Paonia, Colorado, there was a man, um, bless his soul. He was telling me about the deliverance ministries, right? This, this spiritual battlefield that he was a part of and how he, how he learned to expel demons. And I thought, this is very interesting. I'd like to learn more. And I asked him, just out of curiosity. I don't know why. I always have a tendency to ask questions like these. And I said, 
could you tell me where did you learn who taught you how to exercise demons and evil spirits and he said oh no one did i was like okay so how did you learn intuitively intuitively he said i don't know how to tell you this when we are basing our claims anything other than the bible to it we're building our house on shaky ground not on solid rock we're building it in the sand because jesus said that those of us who build our houses on the rock which is Jesus' teaching, our assumptions are good. Those of us who build it on anything other than that, our intuition, our traditions, our personal experiences, all of those things, boom, this assumption is trash. All of this. It's unreliable. The reason why you're not finding peace at your church, perhaps, is because most of the preaching that you're hearing is just this. It's, it's just this right here. Right? It's just assumptions. That's all it is. It's just what the pastor thinks. It, are you satisfied with it? You need to ask yourself that question. Are you satisfied with just hearing your pastor's assumptions? Are you satisfied? Are you, are you content? Are you being satiated? Do you, are you really being fed with God's word? If what you're hearing is, is an illustration, if what you're hearing is just what the pastor thinks, is that, is that what Christ requires of us? When he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Th was he talking about this? Was he talking about holy men? Talking about what they think about God? What they think about how spirituality works? This is, like I said, this is part one to, to the greater problem. I want to, and if you want to join me, um, subscribe, leave a comment, say, what specific thing do you want to explore about demonology? About demon possessions, exorcisms? I'm, right now, I'm, I'm currently looking at the history. I've been looking at the, the biblical data, examining that. And I've come to some really interesting conclusions. Uh, maybe not conclusions, but just some data points that I, that I think are helping to shape what can be called a conclusion later on. If that's something that interests you, leave a comment. Tell me, what are you interested in learning about? What is it that you need feeding from in the Bible? Here's just to satiate you or to... Uh, not satiate, but just to, just to kind of whet your appetite a little bit. Here's, here's something that I found very recently that completely shocked me. Let's go ahead and zoom in right here. The term evil spirits. If you had to guess, how often do you see the term evil spirit in the Bible? That's right. Five times depending on the translation. This is, this is some, some research I did literally just today, and this, this was amazing. What I'm gonna show you is factual data. This isn't, this isn't subjective, this is objectively true. This is actually there. You can verify this, you can go to a Greek manuscript, you can read it in an English translation even, and you will find that this is factually true, right? Namely, that evil spirits in the New Testament occurs five times, at least in the standard version. Put our sources of error up here. In my ESV, I've yet to verify this in other, in other translations, it occurs five times. What I was able to verify is that of those five times, four of them, four times, are in Greek, the word It's not, um, the morphology isn't like this, but this is what the root words are. Neoma and poneros. And for those of you who don't know, um, neoma is the word that we have for spirit. But it also means mind. Okay. So when, when the Greeks talked about the suke, I'll have to verify the actual spelling. My Greek spelling isn't great. But when people were talking about the psyche, when they were talking about the spirit, they were talking about the mind. And so it's interesting that verifiably you can look and the term for evil spirits is bad mind. 
Um, in many translations, Poneros is translated as evil a majority of the time, and sometimes it's not. And the reason for that is because the semantic range for Poneros can just mean any sort of bad thing. Whether that's a moral bad, whether that's a structural bad, like an engineering bad, that would be Poneros. If you had a bridge that was collapsing, it would be a Poneros bridge. Does that mean it's morally evil? I mean, maybe it'll kill lots of people, so in that sense, maybe, right? But, but that's clearly not the semantic range. It's not that narrow. It's not just a moral issue. It's not a morally bad spirit. Or rather, it's a bad mind. Here's another way of thinking. Unwell. Mind. If you have an unwell mind, you know what we call that? We call that mental illness. Okay? I want you to notice right here. This right here, this is my interpretation. Okay, everything I've shown you up until now, that's, that's objectively true. This is how people view the language. This is how I'm choosing to, to postulate, right? This is the one claim I'm going to make. My, my one claim is that this is probably mental illness. And the next piece of objective evidence I'm going to give you is the reason why. All of this appears most relevantly in only one author's writings. I want you to take a moment, put it in the comments right now. Guess, guess which author of the New Testament uses this phrase? It's not Mark, it's not Peter, it's not Paul, it's not Timothy, it's none of them. It's, you know what Luke was? You, you know Luke was a physician, right? He was a doctor. Luke the physician is the only one who relevantly uses this phrase. I say relevantly because it, it appears one time in Matthew, and it's not used by Matthew, it's used by as quoting Jesus. So really the only person who uses it as as like their own words and not quoting Jesus is Luke. The only person who uses it is Luke. He's the only person who identifies Neoma Poneros. Here's where it gets really cool. Every single time that Luke, this is verifiably true. This isn't this isn't an interpretation. This isn't some doctrine. This is what it says. Every time that Neoma Poneros that evil spirit, that mental illness is used by Luke, Dr. Luke, every single time, it is not it is not demons. Every time. Every single time. Do with that what you want. Right? I've done, I've done what I wanted. Okay? This, this seems very compelling to me. From the Bible. Okay? Again, if this is something that interests you, do you want to see a full-on um, video on, on how all of this works? This Sabbath, um, by the time you watch this, that video will already be live. Um, but I will be recording the message I'm giving at Fruta, where we're covering um, part seven, I think, of our very long series on spiritual defenses and spiritual warfare in general. Specifically this Sabbath, we're going to talk about um, demons. How, how do we cast out demons? How does that work in the Bible? And taking a very narrow, very biblical approach, shutting out the, the noise that comes from history and tradition and, and the secular view that has influenced how Christians view spirits, we're just going to take a look at the Bible and, and what the Bible has to say. Unfortunately, it's not a lot. Okay, so I'm going to have to pad it quite a bit. Nonetheless, you'll be able to watch that soon. Um, this video will be live probably this Friday. And then the video will be live on Saturday. So if you want to learn more about this, give me a thumbs up, share this with your friends. Is this something that's interesting to you? Maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe you're like, actually, pastor, here's all these verses that you may never have heard of. Uh, you know, maybe my pages in my Bible are stuck together and I just, I just never bothered to look in those. I'd love, to, I, I desperately want to know what the Bible has to say didactically. That's to say as like a teaching on, on how to cast out demons. I'm sure that you do too. If, if Sister White if Christian, um, if the Christian trajectory of, of seeing the world is right, we're headed for some very troubled waters. We're headed for a time where you need to have spiritual defenses in place. You need to be ready for the attacks of the enemy. Friend, I, this is a call to you. If you are not attending a church, if you're not feeding yourself spiritually, if you're not preparing yourself, I, I can't tell you that you're in danger because I think that's self-evident and that's up for you to decide. If you don't feel like there's any danger, then I'm not going to try and per persuade you. But if you see what I see, if you think this is important, then let's do something about it. 
seek seek sound biblical teaching seek people who are going to push you spiritually and who are going to encourage you to grow in your spirituality um and that's it that's part one of what exactly does the bible say about demons and demon possession the biblical the true biblical view of exorcisms um i want to make a habit of, out of i want to make habit out of praying here on the channel so you're welcome to to close this window if you don't feel comfortable with that otherwise i'm gonna pray Thank you, God, for the word, and thank you for giving us these words, um, words of encouragement to us, or, or rather exhorting us to seek you more fully. We want to be well-nourished by your word. We want to seek leaders who will guide us into the right path and not just into the opinions of men. God, please forgive us of our sins. Help us to be right with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Thank you, guys. I'm Pastor Eli, and this is Ministry in Real Life.